I'm pleased to be here for the unveiling of my Mathematica series, which is this 64-panel painting representing or incorporating some of the great geometrical diagrams and mathematical equations of history. I worked on this piece for almost a year, and the concept for the Mathematica series of the 64 paintings on panel actually came out of a conversation with my son, Chris. We were discussing various end-of-the-world scenarios, like what if an asteroid strikes the Earth again, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, and say that led to a collapse of our advanced civilization, how could we encapsulate the knowledge of our time, perhaps in a symbolic form, that some future archaeologist might unearth that would provide a glimpse of the state of knowledge in our current civilization? So the idea was to create a new or modern Rosetta Stone, that would be aimed at the future. So we thought, well, perhaps a selection of the great mathematical equations and diagrams of history would be a way to encapsulate the knowledge of our time, our contemporary civilization. Mathematical formulations are already highly concentrated symbolic truths, expressions, and they reflect on many fields of human endeavor, including of course, science and technology, but also art and architecture and many other aspects of human culture. So that, that's how we got started on the idea. Now, we first selected this series of eight equations, starting with Euclid's pi and going through Einstein's field equations as an attempt to embrace all of mathematical knowledge. But I soon realized that eight equations wasn't going to be sufficient. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I could go eight times eight 64, 8 squared, 64 panels, and perhaps that would be closer. And the way this table is to be read, by the way, is, is chronologically. The older equations are along the top and the left, and the newer or more modern equations go along the right and the bottom. So it sort of pro proceeds chronologically, roughly, uh, on the diagonal. So, but about the selections. Now, I'm not a historian of mathematics, and neither is my son, Chris, who helped me, you know, pick these out. But if a historian of mathematics were to, say, pick out the 64 greatest equations and geometrical theorems, I'm sure he would pick some that we've picked, like the Pythagorean theorem, for example, or the fundamental calculus equation. But others are more discretionary. Things that I picked some on poetic grounds, like Hippocrates quadrature of the loons, this one here. Uh, it's kind of a beautiful equal area theorem from the ancient world. The crescent shape is the same area as the triangle. Plus it's just beautifully expressed, the quadrature of the loons. I mean, was he a mathematician or, or a poet? <laughs> and then Chris picked out some, my son, like Boltzmann transport equation, like this one, because it has a predictive sense for the future. It's a very significant equation for nanotechnology, which he feels will be a significant technology in the future. Some of the selections are more personal, and basically they're all in an abstract art context because it's all part of my idea that truth and beauty are in a profound alliance, two sides of the same coin, so to speak. And the thing that I'm interested in about mathematical truth is its enduring quality. It, it does not change over time. And that it shares that quality with great art. Great art endures the test of time also. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to appreciate, you know, Raphael's frescoes from 500 years ago, or the uh, paintings in the Valley, Valley of the Kings, the tomb paintings in uh, ancient Egypt. We can appreciate those because art endures through time, and mathematical truth has that same quality. So, as an example of the unchanging nature of mathematical truth. Let's take Archimedes' sphere within the cylinder. This is a relationship a ratio that Archimedes discovered 2,200 years ago that the area of a sphere inscribed within a cylinder is precisely two-thirds the volume of the inscribing cylinder. So that was true 2,200 years ago. It's true today, and it will be true 2,200 years from now. It does not change. 
Nobody comes along with a supercomputer and says, no, 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 we've crunched the numbers, and actually, the sphere within the cylinder is seven-eighths the volume of the enclosing cylinder. That's never going to happen. It's, it's an eternal truth that Archimedes discovered, and truth and beauty share this unchanging quality, enduring through the ages. And each one of these panels represents such an enduring mathematical truth, or eternal mathematical truth. Okay, so... That's the beginning. Now, I wanted to talk about each of the rows, the organization of the table. Like the top row is the foundations row, because many of these are from the ancient world and they're fundamental to what follows. And I'm going to talk about each panel from each row. But the honeycomb tiling, this is uh, something mathematician from the ancient world, Pappas of Alexandria. Who's heard of him? I mean, he was a contemporary of Euclid, but some mathematicians get all of the limelight, I guess. Uh, <laughs> He wrote an entire work on hexagonal tiling or honeycomb tiling. Hexagons are one of only a few shapes that will tile space completely without leaving any gaps. Like we're all familiar with squares, a chessboard also has that same quality. So he was fascinated by this and wrote an entire book about it. Uh, he considered the bees to be nature's perfect architects. And I included this one because it's part of an overarching theme of the Mathematica series that sometimes mathematical knowledge is pursued for its own sake, but then later is found to exemplify some underlying order in nature or in the universe itself. And that's exactly what happens later on. This is the only one in the series that's not an actual equation or diagram. It's an X-ray diffraction picture of the mineral beryl, a derivative of the element beryllium. And if you can see it has the same hexagonal structure that was seen uh, in the previous slide. If you connect these up with straight lines, which, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hexagon. So this is, this is basically like a molecular atomic photograph of the, this mineral structure. So overarching theme, sometimes mathematical knowledge pursued for its own sake, later is found to reflect the underlying order of nature and reality itself. Okay, so the next series is the Sacred Geometry series. Now, this series I included partly to see if I could aggravate any of the left brain types who might be in the audience, my uh, scientist uh, <laughs> friends or engineers, with the ambiance of mysticism. That, but but it also because a lot of uh, mathematical knowledge in the ancient world was produced in a religious or a spiritual context. So the golden section proportion is something that the ancients used to create their art and architecture. Great works of architecture like the Parthenon and the pyramids were created according to this formulation. And it's, it's beautifully expressed in this logarithmic spiral that you see in all of the, <coughs> the interior rectangles. They're all the same proportion as they expand uh, in space. So it also exemplifies the principle of self-similar similar growth that we see in plants. You know, like I have a ficus tree in my studio. When the leaves are really little, they're the same shape as when they get bigger. <laughs> How does it do that? Mathematically, this is an expression of that principle of self-similar growth. So then the next row is geometry. And I included this row because it's much knowledge, again, from the ancient world was expressed in terms of relationships of shape and volume rather than numerical. So the conic sections of Apollonius this is something, again, this overarching theme of mathematical knowledge pursued for its own sake, but then later on it's found to <coughs> exhibit a relationship to the structures in nature. There were four conic sections that Apollonius discovered. These are like planes intersecting a cone of uh, solid geometry. The circle, which I've been working with for years in my artwork. The ellipse, which is just an oval. The parabola and the hyperbola. And the parabola and the hyperbola are featured in these two paintings, the uh, Eminence and Transcendence works, the gold painting and this blue one. But the one that I wanted to talk about here is the ellipse, which is it's the shape or the, the figure that uh, was employed by Johannes Kepler in the 17th century to solve the riddle of planetary motion because the true shape of the planetary orbits are ellipses. And prior to that time, astronomers were always trying to fit the planetary motions that they observed into the planets being perfectly, perfect heavenly circles. And of course, they're, they're not. It's elliptical. So once again, the mathematical 
abstract mathematical truth precedes our comprehension of something in nature itself. Okay, so going on one more, I'm going to just go through each of these. This next, um, this next series is the contributions of Asia and the Middle East. This figure is called Pascal's Triangle because we tend to think that we invented everything in the West, but uh, <laughs> it just isn't so. There are a lot of contributions from Asia that are very significant. But th So this is the same figure, Pascal's Triangle, but from a actually a printed book from the Song Dynasty predating Pascal by 300 years. And it, but it's the same table of, or triangle of exponents and root extraction. It's the same mathematical understanding, but predating the uh, European invention of it by hundreds of years. Okay, this is the first series uh, that Chris and I picked out, it's the original series, and uh, the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, many people would be familiar with that, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And this, this one I use all the time in my work because there is a maximum size painting that I can fit out the studio door. You know? <laughs> so uh, it's uh, basically, I mean, it, it, it's, 80, it's about 80 inches. And you know, so I've got a rectangular studio door. You take the diagonal and you get two right angle triangles, which is related to the Pythagorean theorem. If I try to go straight out with the painting, it doesn't work, but if I take it out on the diagonal, it will just fit out. So, and the people at the gallery are happy to know that there's a maximum size to the paintings that I can produce because there is a direct proportion between the artist's ego and the size of the paintings that they produce. You, may, you, you all may not know that, but it's, it, it's true. So, since the artist's ego is practically limitless, I would be producing huge, like 16-foot paintings, you know. But fortunately, well, although I did exceed it in this one, this one's like 92 inches, but by doing it, I split it up into panels. But don't worry, I'm not going to do that again uh, anytime soon, because this was a lot of work. Oh, and, you know, also it reminds me, you know, like when you were in, maybe in junior high school or in high school, you're taking algebra, and all the other kids are saying, I'm never going to use this math in my work. You know, I'm not going to, see, I use the Pythagorean theorem in my work all the time. You know, so, uh, okay, the next series, uh, the one I selected, this is the harmonic series, superstring theory. Some people might be familiar with that. It's one of the latest attempts to find Einstein's dream, the unified field theory, a set of equations or a single equation that would unite all of the physical forces in the universe, electromagnetism, gravity and the nuclear forces, all in one set of equations. But you see how complicated this equation is. It's like, and this is just one from, can you see that from there? I don't know if everybody can see it from there, but maybe, see how complicated that is? And full disclosure here, I can't do the math on this, you know, but my son Chris can. So that's, it's good to know that our children can exceed us, right? But I think it's a little too complicated for a theory of every, everything. But nobody's asking me, really. So. Okay, going on to the next series, this is probability distribution. Now, this is a real contribution of Pascal, the scientist that I mentioned earlier, or mathematician I mentioned earlier. This one, it's basically, it's indispensable for modern science, science as we know it. Probabilistic determinations are so important. And how he arrived at this is by doing studies on rolling dice. Like, nobody can predict the roll of the dice once. But if you roll the dice 100 times, you start to see patterns emerge. Like, for example, double sixes are much rarer than combinations of threes and fours. So you can start to numerically analyze all of that and come up with a, a predictive uh, quality. So this is a very crucial uh, equation for modern science. Interestingly, uh, this is why Stephen Hawking, you know, the Big Bang cosmologist, uh, he says that it's so difficult to tell what happened in the early universe right in the first few seconds of the universe because there were so few events. There were really big events like, you know, the creation of all matter in the universe and <laughs> the, the beginning of time itself, but still very few events. So it defies probabilistic treatment. Okay, and then the last series here is uh, this one. The last series kind of either, there are some equations that either point to the future or point to the limits of mathematical knowledge. So this one is chaos theory. It's actually May's logistic model for population growth. So he was doing a study in more like population biology, but an inadvertent conclusion of this equation is that 
Chaos is a result of differential equations. And differential equations are just so fundamental, again, to our modern science and mathematics. I also included this one just because it has a really cool name, you know, chaos, chaos theory, right? That's it for my immediate talk, but just some su summary comments. One thing is, uh, the gallery folks will be passing out test papers now. <laughs> and when you're done with your answers, you can just pass them forward. No, I'm just kidding. Really, because if I did that, you would never come to my next opening, right? <laughs> uh, no, that's not it. But, you know, sometimes I'll have, give a talk, and then I'll have a question and answer session. But this time, no questions, please. <laughs> so I want to leave everybody in a state of bafflement. No, that's not why. It's just because it would take too long. You know, we can all have now some bubbly water, and then I'll be up here to answer questions. And if any of the questions are too difficult, you know, I can refer you to the real scientists in the audience, Alan Lucero or Craig Kresswitz, to answer them. But if you want the highly imaginative version, I will speak it with great authority and certainty, okay? <laughs> you know, so I just, I worked on this for a year. It was very... Um, you know, a source of great inspiration and excitement for me, and I hope you all share in that uh, inspiration and excitement. Thank you. <laughs>